All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to week two of Intro to Linux. Thank you for being here. Slightly sparser crowd this week. Hopefully that levels now. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to start by going over some more of the commands, some of which we touched on last week, others of which uh, will be new. We'll probably spend the first half of the class going through some commands, and then we're going to be getting into a few other topics that will be pertinent for the following weeks. So don't feel like you have to immediately memorize every command we say. Uh, one, well, that list is online. These are already on it. You can always go and look the commands up again afterwards. It's more take away these commands exist. These are the kind of problems you can solve with them so that at least you know what to go looking for if you're in a situation where you need to use it. Are there any outstanding questions or anything people need to get answered before we get started? All right. So we talked last week about a number of the commands that kind of deal with the file system, things that deal with looking at permissions, things that deal with looking at the attributes of a file, listing the files in a directory. So because Linux is so file-centric, the file is such a core object within the operating system, many of the commands we deal with are also going to be related to what we can do with files. And a lot of the things, even we don't have actual files, we'll get to the point where we start abstracting things to think of them as files, even if an actual file doesn't exist. Uh, you can use files to represent just generalized output from a program, generalized input to another program, uh, even if it never is actually stored in a file, whatever that happens to be, on disk. So we'll start by looking at, uh, just real quick, I'll go through the commands we talked about last week that kind of deal with navigating and looking at the file system. Obviously, we have the ls command, which lists the directory, tells you what's in the current directory. You can get more details by doing ls-l, which gives you all the details, including the permissions, the owners, the owning group, when it was last modified, the size, and the name, like we looked at last week. ls-l. Can everyone see this okay? Shout at me if it's too small or anything. Um, so ls-l on most systems is shortcutted to ll. So if you just type ll, that's just an alias for ls-l. They do the same thing. You can do ls-a. That'll show you all the files in the directory, including any file that starts with a dot, which are hidden when you run the ls command normally. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other flags you can actually give it. If you do man ls, you can read about, in addition to the a flag, which we talked about, and the l flag, which is down here somewhere we talked about, you can see there's a number of other flags that might also be useful depending upon what you're trying to do. So read the man page uh, if you have detailed questions. But ls command, you'll use it all the time. It tells you what's in the current directory. So the next question is, well, what directory are we in? We looked at this command last week, too, but the pwd command, or print working directory command, tells me where in the file system I'm currently located. Whenever you have a terminal open, your terminal is always kind of focused or currently located in a specific node in the big file tree that's on your system. So we're currently in the slash, so the start of the file tree, home directory, and then my username inside that directory is where we're sitting right now. We're essentially sitting in my home folder. Um, the pwd command also has flags to go along with it. I don't actually know any of them because you rarely use them. But if you want to know, and not very many flags, it has all of three flags to go along with it. Uh, you can read about them on the man page as well. So we can see what's in our, the directory. We can see what directory we're currently in. Um, the next question then is, well, how do we go about changing directories? What if we want to move somewhere else within the file system? Have I lost anyone yet? Let me know if I'm moving too quickly. Okay, so we're currently in the home a sailor directory, but let's say, or we'll run ls again. So let's say I want to go into one of these folders that is inside the folder I'm currently in. So I don't think I have anything embarrassing in my downloads folder. Maybe we'll use another folder just to be safe. Um, this is why you don't normally demo on your own laptop, right? Uh, so let's say I want to look at what's in my documents folder. So I did this cd to my documents folder. Uh, I can cd, so the command is cd for change directory, and then the name of whatever folder I want to change into. Most terminals have a pretty good autocomplete feature, so you'll see if I go and type in doc and then hit tab, it's going to autocomplete with whatever logically makes sense based upon the current context. You can also do this with commands. We haven't gotten any commands that are long enough to really make it worthwhile, uh, but when you start to get to commands that are entire words, the autocomplete feature is pretty handy. 
Um, and it's just painful to watch people type in file names that are like three miles long when they could just hit tab a couple of times and have the whole thing. So if you want to go to the documents directory, I can do CD documents. Now if I do, I'm turn off caps lock. Now if I do LS, we'll see what happens to be in my documents directory. Not much. If I do PWD again, we'll see I have in fact changed into my documents directory. Uh, I could do CD again to change into one of these folders. So we'll note that this folder does have a space in it. We touched on this briefly last time, but there's two ways that you, I can't just do CD my drawings. If I try to do this, it's gonna give me a no such file directory because this space is a delimiter and it thinks my is the name of the folder I wanna to go to. So instead, I either have to put my drawings in quotes or I have to escape the space. That's correct, right? Um, so if I put a slash in front of the space, it's going to know not to actually treat that as a space, to treat it as a logical space. This is harder to read. Generally, you would just always do it. If you were typing it by hand, you would always use quotations. Uh, if you do go to autocomplete it, though, the slash, it'll autocomplete using the slash. So that's what that means. It just means treat this as a space, the character, not a space, the delimiter. All right? So if I do that, then we're in that folder. I don't have anything in that folder. So like I said, if you run a Unix command, you get no output. That's the default for nothing is there. It doesn't print some folder is empty or anything like that message. Uh, there's a very strong philosophy that if a command doesn't do anything, that it shouldn't output anything. Um, so in this case, it doesn't output anything. It's an empty folder. So we can do PWD again. We are, in fact, at that point in the file tree now. Uh, so now the question is, well, how do I go back up a level? So I want to get to the previous folder. If we do ls-a to display everything, we'll see every directory actually contains two special directories, the dot directory and the dot dot directory. So the dot directory is in fact a reference to the directory you're currently in. So if I do cd dot and then do pwd again, nothing's changed. I just ran cd to change into the directory I'm currently in. Um, you would never really do that, but sometimes this is handy. So anytime you see a file name that starts with a dot, it means you're referring to a file in the current directory. Um, whereas when you see a file name starting with a slash, it means you're referring to a file rooted at the root of the file tree. Uh, the other one is the double dot. So the dot refers to the directory I'm currently in. The double dot refers to the directory that's my directory's parent. So the directory that the directory I'm in is in. Uh, that's not levels of interaction. So for everyone. For my drawings, it goes to documents. Is that what you're saying? If you double dot? Yes. So if we look at the PWD, so the double dot, in fact, refers to this document, the, the, the my drawings. So I'm in my drawings right now, right? Yeah. So the double dot refers to home a sailor documents. So I can use the double dot really for any command. So if I want to see what's in the folder above the folder I'm currently in, if I do ls double dot, we'll see. So I'm looking back at this again. If I do ls double dot slash my drawings, I'll essentially, that's the, so that's the exact same thing as ls in this case, or as ls dot. Those are all three doing the exact same thing relative to my current location. Um, so by that same feature, if I want to go back up a directory, I would do cd double dot. And now if we look, I am in fact in the directory one higher. You can do this multiple times. So if I want to go up two directories, I can do cc dot dot forward slash, because that's what we put between directories in Unix, dot dot again. Now if I do print working directory, you'll see I went up two directories. I went up to ASALA, then I went all the way up to home. I'm currently in the slash home directory. Make sense? So the CD command is basically how you're going to navigate around the file system. Um, in addition to doing kind of relative paths like I'm doing now, these are all referenced based on the folder I'm currently in. We can also give, just like everything else, we can give CD absolute paths. So if I want to CD to my bin directory for some reason, uh, or better yet, if I want to go change a setting, so etc. is the directory where most of the settings for programs are stored. So it would be slash etc. because this is a relative to the root of the file system, not relative to my current folder. Um, if we actually look at my current folder, we will see there is no etc. directory. So you can tell I'm, I'm definitely trying to move to a directory relative to the root. Uh, so etc. and then I could, this is also where tab can be handy. If I hit tab twice, it's going to display every possible completion. So it doesn't, if there's only one possible completion, it'll fill it in. If there's multiple possible completions, you hit it once, nothing will happen. But if you hit it again, it'll show you the list of all possible completions. 
So if I'm trying to figure out, I don't quite remember what the name of the program is, uh, I want to go change A, I want to go change something for Apache, I have to do. So I just have to scroll through all of its options, but eventually it all. So if I want to go to the Apache folder, which was in that list I just saw, I can start typing Apache. So you'll see now I've reduced the list of what starts with an AP, I can go a little bit further. And now there's only one completion, so it's going to finish auto-completing. And now I'm in the Apache directory. Questions on listing the contents of directory, finding the name of our current directory, or changing directories? How do you do auto-complete? Tab. It should be. So not everywhere in the world has this feature, but definitely in the VMs and in pretty much any sane terminal on any modern system, tab is going to auto-complete for you. If you're SSH'd into some antiquated 25-year-old Unix machine, you probably don't have this feature. Uh, but on anything modern, tab's going to auto-complete. And just one more time, I know tab auto-completes. How do you get it to list out all the potential? So items? tab twice. Tab um, twice, OK. So you will see, so uh, let's find another example. Um, so if I try to do that same thing again, ls, etc. And then I'm not going to list everything, but let's say I want to see everything that starts with an A. So I would type an A. If I hit tab once, nothing happens because there is not a single autocomplete. But if I hit tab again, then we'll see it's going to print out every possible completion based on what I currently have typed, which means everything that starts with an A. If you hit tab twice and nothing happens, it means there is no, so like there is nothing that starts with an AX. So I can hit tab all day and nothing's going to happen. There okay. is no possible completions. Okay. All right. Now, how do we get back to the, the home folder that we were in? So we can just do the opposite of what we just did. So uh, we're actually over in a different part of the file system now. Etc. is separate. We, so home and etc. are both at the top level. If we just list our root, so if we do ls slash, so this is the root of the file system. We'll see. So we're currently over here in the etc. folder. The home folder is over here. So there's multiple ways we could get to home. We could go up one level which would take us back. So we could go all the way up to the root, and then we could dive back down into home. Or we can just go there directory by doing cd slash home, and then whatever my username is. So now I'm back in my home folder. If I want to go back to my actual home folder, I have to go into the user folder within the slash home folder. So in my case, it would be a sailor. In your guys' case, it'll be user on the VM. It'll be whatever username you're using on any other system. So what happens if I do cd dot dot and etc if I do cd dot dot? So that would take us back up. So if we go back to etc, so right now we're sitting in etc, right? So if we use cd dot dot, dot we're going to wind back up at just root. So and if we do pwd here, so this is the root of the file system. It's where the tree is anchored, right? So it's one tree in Unix, and it's all anchored here. So you can't actually. So this is a little bit of file system trivia, but. The way root the, the way root's defined is root is the only directory for which dot and dot dot point to the same thing. Because you can't go, there is no parent to this directory, it's its own parent, it's the root of the file system. So you'll notice if I do ls dot dot here, and if I do ls dot, I'm gonna get exactly the same. And that's how you know you're at root. I mean that's how that's how programs test for the root of the file system is to look it's the only directory where that's true, where dot and dot dot is equal. It's also really convenient to CD with nothing goes to your home directory. So I, yeah, I type that all the time. It just takes you back to where you started. That's not universally guaranteed either, but that's a pretty standard convention on any modern system. The other thing that's handy, so we know that anything that starts with a dot is going to be referenced to our current directory. Anything that doesn't start with a dot or a slash is also referenced to our current directory. Anything that starts with a slash is referenced to home. There's one more uh, handy thing. Anything that's referenced to tilde slash references your home directory automatically. So tilde slash is always your home directory for your current user. Uh, and if you go to autocomplete it, it'll normally expand it. We'll see if my, okay. Well, it's not going to expand it. But if I just do that, that's the exact same as doing ls slash home slash async. So tilde slash is just a shortcut to mean relative to my home directory do this. Because sometimes I might be off in another part of the file system but still want to do something in my home directory. And instead of having to do an absolute path, there is the tilde shortcut is handy in that case. Can you change the font size that it will be able to do this? Better? Good. 
Anything else? Okay, so that's kind of the core of moving around the file system, CD. You can always tell where you're at by using PWD, and you can tell what's in the folder and where you might want to go next by using LS. Uh, so those are kind of your core file system navigation commands. Um, Another command Matt touched on it briefly last week, I'm not going to go into it, but sometimes you need more information about a file, like a particular file, than ls can give you. So if I do ls-al on a file, um, so I can do ls-al on a file, and it gives me a bit of detail about the file, but sometimes I want even more than this. The stack command will give me even more information on the file, mainly with respect to kind of, a lot of this starts to get into how the underlying file system works and isn't stuck on a day-to-day basis, but there is the stack command, it does exist, it gives you even more information about the file than you would get normally. Um, well, that's next. Okay, so we know how to move around the file system, so the next step is, well, how do we kind of manipulate things in the file system? So I'm gonna change back to my home directory using the tilde slash convention. So, there is no LDS command. It'd be interesting to see what that would do. Um, probably produce a Republican presidential candidate. And now that we're in our home directory, let's play with uh, changing some files around and seeing what we can actually do to manipulate files. So, the first command that you generally deal with when you're manipulating files is the touch command. Touch does two things. If you run it on a file that doesn't yet exist, it creates a new empty file. If you run it on a file that does exist, it updates the modified timestamp to the current time. So touching a file, so you don't even have to like go into a file. That's why you can't ever really trust modified timestamps. You can change them without editing the file. But if you had a text file that the most recent, I mean, we can demo this. Uh, so first, let me touch a new file. Let's create it. We'll just call it new file. If we do ls now, we'll see we have our new file here. If we want to see the details on it. We'll see, we have this new file. It was created today at 5.51. I hope my demo doesn't fail. So we have to wait at least one minute. Good, the computer now thinks it's 5.52. So if I do that same thing again, and then run ls-al again, you'll see it updated the timestamp for the current time. So touch either updates the timestamp or creates a new file. Most of the time you use touch to create a new file. Every now and then it's handy to modify the timestamp. The main place this is handy is if you're using a version control system or something, which we'll get into later. If you're using some kind of a system that keeps track of when files were modified to do something, like mate or something like that, then sometimes touching a file forces the system to think that you've changed something and forces it to do some action that it wouldn't do otherwise. So, touch command. The next command that we generally want to deal with is, well, we can create a new file, we can update the timestamp, but often you don't want to create new files from scratch, you want to create a new file by copying an existing file. So that's where the CP command comes in. Uh, so I'm actually going to, are we going to do captain stuff on here? Yeah, why not? Um, this is getting some of your stuff, but let me show it again. So there's a command on Linux called cat. What it does is it just takes either the contents of a file, if you specify a file name here, uh, or actually cat always takes the contents of the file. Um, and it just spits it out to the screen. There's another program called Echo, which just takes whatever you type after it and prints it out on the screen as well. So if we say Echo, hello world, we'll see it prints hello world here. What does cat do? It cat just takes the, so cat, cat and Echo are somewhat similar. Echo prints whatever you type here to the screen. Mm -hmm. Cat reads whatever file you have here and prints the contents of that file to the screen. Okay. So, so it's like a uh, text file to the the yes, uh, cat actually. What cat actually does is it concatenates files. It takes two files and spits them out on standard, or it takes any number of files and spits them out one after another. But when you pass it just one file and no destination, that's the same as most of the time you use cat just to spit a file to the screen, even though that wasn't exactly what it was originally intended for. Um, but so we have the cat and echo command. The main reason I'm showing you these now, even though they don't have to do with other stuff, is because they're about to be handy here in a sec. Um, so by default, when I echo something, it prints it out to the screen. Printing it out to the screen is what we call standard out or standard output. So by default, echo is sending this to standard output, which in my current terminal just gets printed to the screen. Now, sometimes we want to redirect standard output. So what if I don't want to print hello world to the screen? What if instead I want to store print hello world into a file? So I can do that as well. In fact, you can do this with any command. 
So this is uh, a type of indirection operator. What it does is it says take the output from this command and send it to whatever file name is specified here. So we have that new file that we looked at earlier. If I run cat on it, it's going to print its contents to the screen. It's an empty file. So we use touch to create it. It has no content. Our new file is currently empty. Catting it returns nothing. But now if I want to send something to that file, I can do an echo of hello world and then I can specify the file name. So you'll notice that this time nothing got printed to the screen. Instead, what normally would have got printed to the screen got written to this file. So now if I cat that file, we'll notice that the file itself has the value of hello world in it. There are actually two ways to send data to a file. There's a single caret like this and there's also the double caret. The single caret overwrites the file. So if I do this again, and cat it again, I'm going to get the exact same thing. Just hello world on one line in the file. But normally or often what you end up wanting to do, especially in things like logging, is you don't want to overwrite the file. You just want to add what you're printing to the end of the file. So you want to append to the file. So if you use two carrots like so, now it's going to append to the file. So if I do two carrots new file, and now I cat new file, you'll notice that hello world's there twice. Once the first time I sent the file, once the second time, I could put something new here just to prove that I'm not just copying that. So you'll see by using the double caret, I'm getting new lines in the file each time. If I go to use the single caret again, it's going to overwrite the file. So now I'm back. I just have that because it erased everything and then wrote a new copy of third line into it. So questions on cat echo or the append or overwrite operators? These become very important in Linux along with another class of operators called pipe operators that are closely related to them. Because everything is essentially represented as a file in the Linux operating system, the ability to kind of take outputs from programs, send them to files, take the output from one file, send it to another file, starts to become really important. Just a quick question on cat. You said cat's original meaning was to concatenate two files. So can you show an Yes. So let's say, OK, so here's another thing I can show at the same time. So if you use the single operator, does the double operator throw an error if you use a file that doesn't exist? No. OK, so if you use either one of these, the file doesn't have to exist first. So we created the file first by using touch. But I could also just right off the bat say new file 2. Now if we look, I have two things that start with new file. New file, which is the one I originally did, and new file 2. And let's put different things in them. So I'm going to go ahead and write a number of lines to new file. So the first line, I'm going to erase it and overwrite it. The second line, I want to append. And the third line, I also want to append. And then I want to write some things to new file 2 as well. So first line of another file. And then we'll also append the second line to that file. Okay. So now I have two files. I have two files. They're slightly different sizes because one has three lines of text in it. The other only has two lines of text. They both have been updated fairly recently. So if I use the cat operator on any one file, so if I just cat new file, I get the contents of new file. If I just cat new file 2, I get the contents of new file 2. But if I specify them both at the same time, then cat does what it's actually intended to do. And it takes the first file and appends the second file to it and then spits it all out. Now, if I actually wanted to append these files, it'd probably be more useful. I don't just want it on the screen. I want it in a third file, right? Mm -hmm. So I would take the output from cat, do the same thing I've been doing with echo, and call this new file 3. Now new file 3 is the concatenation of new file and new file 2. If I look at just new file 3 all by itself, you can see I have the combination of the first two files. Can you have two files with exactly the same name but different types in the folder? What do you mean types? Like txt, doc. So this is a good point. There are no such thing as file types in Linux. Uh, the dot is meaningless. Uh, so I can have a file name. You will note that these two files have no type. There is no file name after them, right? So if I do ls 
None of these say new file.txt, none of them say new file.exe. Unlike Windows, there are not any hard associated types in Unix systems. These happen to be text files, but they're just text files by the nature of fact that I'm storing text in them, right? Um, I could put a txt ending on them, it wouldn't change anything. So that brings us to our next command, maybe. Uh, mv is the move command. It actually is used in two cases, to move files from point A to point B. It's also the rename command. Uh, if you think about it, a rename really is just a move. You're moving a file from one name to another name. So Unix, not wanting to duplicate functionality, it already has a command that does move, we'll also use it for renames. So let's say I want to rename this. Let's say I, I care about reminding myself that these are text files. So I'm going to move new file. So the original name's new file, and then I just type in the new name. In this case, it's going to be new file.txt. And if I run that ls again, now I have a txt ending on it, but that doesn't change anything. There is no, this txt is completely meaningless. I mean, cat's gonna do the same thing. Anything else is gonna do the same thing. In general, Linux programs are completely agnostic to the file ending. There are some conventions. In general, anything that's a C program file, that C source code is gonna end in .c. Anything that's C++ source code is gonna end in .cpp. Uh, anything that is an, so normally files that have no ending it either means that they're a text file or it means that they're an executable program. Um, the exe ending, which is what Windows uses to signify an executable program, you almost never see in Unix. Uh, .tex would be for LaTeX files or tech files. Uh, .py would be for Python scripts. Um, .java would be for Java files. But that's all just convention. Really, and we'll get to this later when we start to look at some programs, but. I can give the C compiler any file I want. It's not like it's going to balk if it doesn't end in the .c. So there are some conventions, but unlike Windows, if you go to, it doesn't, no program really puts that much into the end. Um, if you're using the GUI, there are some associations. So if you're going through the GUI and you double click on a file, it has to have some way of guessing what program to open it with. And in that case, it will sometimes try to use the line, it will try to use the line endings. Or if I'm in Emacs, which is a text editor we're gonna talk about later, uh, it'll use the line ending to try to figure out what type of programming language the code is in and then color code based upon that language. So some programs do use them, but nothing, it's not nearly as strong an association as Windows. And no program really does anything that would totally break if it got it wrong. It just uses them to try to guess something that might make your life a little bit easier. All right. Other Some questions? programs like Python need a .py, right? Uh, Python shouldn't care. Uh, it kind of depends on the version of Python you have. But really, if you cat a file into the Python interpreter, it's going to assume it's Python. And if it's not, you're going to get a nice syntax error. It's not going to go, oh, this file doesn't end in .py, and therefore I shall not read it. It's going to try to play around with it regardless. Um, there might be some versions of Python. So if you're running Python on Windows, it might balk at you. But in a Unix environment, uh, in general, it's pretty frowned upon for things to make hard and fast decisions based upon the file ending uh, because they get very arbitrary very fast. And one other question, could you do what you just did there using the copy command instead of read? Yes, but then you'd end up with two files. So if I, in this case, I just wanted to rename the file to .txt. If I actually wanted to create a copy of the file, then yeah, I could use the so copy command as well. CP and as a matter of fact, you have to give CP two arguments. So CP always creates a new file in the destination. So whatever second name you specify, if it's a file that already exists, you're going to overwrite the existing file. If it's a file that doesn't exist, it'll create a new file. So if I did that same thing I just did with CP, so I could copy this and we'll call this new file. I don't know. We're up to like three now. We'll also name it .txt. So now I have both new file three and the original new file I copied from. So the move and copy commands both take, I mean, really the one command's a subset of the other. Move is copy plus delete is the way the commands actually work. So both these commands make a take your source file, make a copy to a new file named whatever the second argument is. The only difference is copy stops there, move then goes and deletes the original file. So what if you want to move the file to another directory? So is there um, you can do the same thing. So, and bear in mind what I said about move and copy being the same thing isn't entirely true. There are some differences, but you can think about it that way. Uh, from the user's perspective, they're true. Um, so if we want to move something to a new directory, so 
let's, uh, okay, well, let's do that. So the next command to talk about is how do we create a new directory? So let's create a directory. We have all of these files I'm demoing with. Right now, all of these files are just sitting inside my home directory, which is kind of messy because I like to keep my home directory a little bit more organized than it is right now, and I don't want new files just peppered all over the place. So let's create a new directory, and let's call it the new file directory. So uh, the mkdir command is for make directory. New file directory means make a directory call whatever you happen to type in. You can type anything there. So I'm going to do this. Now if we do ls, we'll see we do in fact have the new file directory hanging out right over here. So now let's say I want to copy the new files into that directory. Uh, or better yet, I want to copy them, I want to move them. So you could also do this with copy, but in this case I'm trying to clean up, so I actually want to move them, I don't just want copies of them. So I can do mv new file, and we'll do new file 2, and then I just give the destination. So there are two things I could do here. If I typed another name here, it would move this file into this directory and rename it whatever name I typed. But normally when you're moving something into a directory, we're using the move functionality of move, right? Not the rename. So I'm just going to leave this blank. And it's going to go take the existing file name and keep that file name in the new directory. So if I do this, and then if I do ls new file directory, we'll see my new file 2 is still in there. Now I also want to move the rest of these new file commands. One way I could do that, so you can actually move, you can specify multiple files. So I could do new file 3, you have file 3.txt, and if I hit enter, it's going to basically treat whatever the last argument is as the destination, and any argument prior to that, it's going to move into there. If you try to do this and specify a file name here, you'd get an error because Move doesn't know how to rename multiple files to the same file name. Um, but if you just do it like this, Move's going to assume that you're anything except the last argument sources, and the last argument has to be a directory in that case that's a destination. Uh, so I could type out all these file names. That's actually a little bit inefficient. Instead, we can take advantage of the fact, and we'll get into this more later, but everything else we want to move, it all starts with this common base of new file, right? So I can use what's called a wildcard, in this case the asterisk, which is a match all wildcard, that basically says, take any file that starts with new file and then doesn't matter what it has after this point, and perform the move on them. So if I do this, and then if I do ls new file directory, You'll see and move the rest of the new file commands in there. There are no longer any new files in the folder I'm currently in. So you can use the uh, same thing to move directories from one directory to Right. So uh, say I have, uh, so let's say I want to make another directory and I'm going to call it uh, Linux Intro, right? Because that's what we're doing right now. So now if I want to put the new file directory into that directory, I can take the new file directory targeted in Linux intro. There is no longer a new file directory here. There is a new file directory now inside Linux intro. Any other questions? Okay, so then the last thing is we know how to create files, we know how to create directories, we know how to move and copy files and directories, we know how to modify files, either by touch just to update the timestamp or by actually echoing things into them. Um, we can also, of course, delete files and directories. So I'm going to go into the new file directory we're in a minute ago. And let's say I've decided I don't want new file 2 anymore because it was never very good to be. So I can use the rm command, which for remove, then I can give it the name of the file, and the full name of the file, and it'll delete the file. So if we look now, that file no longer exists. Now let's say, well, really, I don't need any of these. They're all kind of silly. So let's go ahead and remove the directory. So if we do rm new file directory, we'll see we'll get a nice error because it'll tell us it's, not a, it's a directory, not a file. By default, without any extra flags, the rm command will only operate on files. It won't actually go to remove an entire directory. So there's another command to remove a directory called rmdir. So let's try that. Just like mkdir, it's rmdir. We'll do new file directory. And it coughs at me too. It says, well, I'd love to remove this directory, but it's not empty. So it's kind of being a pain in the ass, right? It's saying essentially to really remove this directory, what I'd have to do is go in manually delete each file with remove, come back out, and then you remove directory, remove the whole directory. 
that's the way it originally was, and that's what you originally had to do. Uh, obviously, it's okay if deleting isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. It prevents people from making silly mistakes. But enough people got lazy that they decided they didn't want to do this anymore, so they, in fact, added a flag to the rm command called the recursive flag, so rm-r. What rm-r says is go into whatever directory I'm specifying, recurse into that directory, call rm on anything inside that directory, step up, and then call rmdir on the directory itself. So if I do rm-r and now do new file directory, it deleted the entire directory and everything inside it. Uh, this quickly, I guess it's worth noting, leads us to the most dangerous command in Linux, which is rm-r star, which means start in the directory I'm in and delete everything. So I will run this right now because I'm currently in a directory that doesn't have anything in it, right? We'll go ahead and touch something just to prove it. But so all I have in it is one file. So I can do rm-r star in here, not that you should ever really run this command. And it deleted the one file in my directory. If, however, I was not paying attention and I was where you are most of the time, namely sitting inside my home directory, and I did rm-r star, very quickly and without warning, we delete every single one of my files on this computer. So you can get yourself into trouble. It's not Windows. It's not going to say, are you sure you want to delete it? There is no recycling bin. When you delete it, it's, I mean, it's only gone, gone. If you're a file systems expert, yes, you can get it back. But if you're a normal person, it's gone. Uh, and you're just going to have to deal with that. There is a recycle bin in Ubuntu because it's a desktop operating system called the trash down here. But the only time things go to the trash is when you delete them from the GUI. So if you're in the GUI, so this mimics more or less Windows behavior. So if we're in here, I come and I hit delete on one of my directories, it'll go to the recycle bin or the trash bin, I can empty it later, great. But for those of us, and when you're working on the command line, there is no recycle bin. It completely skips it. When you delete it, it's deleted for real. Is it possible to use that command from root? And if so, what would happen? To use the command from root? Yeah, RM. Yes. Um, you should be even more careful. <laughs> so the one thing stopping me now is I can only delete files that I own. So uh -huh. I could go and nuke my entire home directory, because in my home directory I own all the files, right? They're all my files. I can nuke my home directory. Life would suck. I'd lose a lot of work. Not actually, because I keep good backups, but I could potentially lose a lot of work. Uh, and that'd be fine. But if I tried to do something even worse, right? So instead of rm-r star, I wonder if I can do this one for a little bit. I'll try not to. Um, but if instead I did root star, so this says not only delete everything in the current directory, this says go to the root of the file system and delete the entire file system, right? Now, I'm not going to try to run this command because there may in fact be some files that I actually own in the root folder right now. But normally if you run this command and if the root folder is designed correctly, most of those files are owned by the root user. So if I do this, I'm going to get a whole bunch of permissions errors right now and it's not actually going to let me delete anything, right? Uh, which is good because you'd effectively destroy your machine if you did this, right? It would not boot up when you were done. So, um, But if I stuck sudo in front of this, then nothing's going to stop me anymore. And it's going to go and delete everything. It'll probably get through it because all of the files Linux needs are actually stored in memory while it's running. So I should be able to delete everything from disk. As soon as you go to turn off your machine, it's a brick. You won't be able to start it the next time. Uh, everything's gone. You'll really need to reinstall the file system or restore the desktop backup. So the only, yes, you can do all this as sudo. When you're sudo or when you're root, you have to be even more careful because the few fail safes that are in place to keep you from doing something really stupid really aren't in place then. So just stay, be, think extra hard every time you type in rm-r, and think extra, extra hard every time you type in rm-r and you have a wildcard character somewhere in there. And think really hard in the time you put a pseudo in front of it. You will inevitably go and delete something stupid. It happens to all of us. Hope you have a good backup when you do. I mean, inevitably you're like, oh, I'll be clever. I have all these trash files in my program full of code that got spit out when my program broke. I'll delete them all in one fell swoop. I'll type in the command wrong and I'll actually delete everything in the entire folder, including all my program files in the first place. And that sucks if you don't have a backup. Nothing you can do about it. So slow down, think about it, pay attention. Uh, you can screw yourself over surprisingly quickly. Okay, cool. The dash command is used to access the flags, right? Or yeah, so in general, any Linux command, if it has extra options or flags, they're almost always proceed with the dash. Some commands follow kind of an older convention, which precedes them with a double dash. Uh, often what you'll see is a single dash, and R is for the short name of the command. 
Uh, often this will also have a corresponding long name. I don't actually know if this works for RM, but uh, often there'll be a long name for the command too, and some commands only have long, or some flags only have long names. They don't have short names. So often the long names will use the double dash, the short so names this will use complete? the single dash. Uh, depends on the command. So all of these auto, so for files, autocomplete is easy. You can yeah. just run its own ls command and figure out how to get off that. To know what to autocomplete for the command, it, it has to have some extra logic in it that knows all of the possible RM options. Some commands will autocomplete, some commands won't. It kind of depends on if the program has provided a special file to the terminal so it knows what to autocomplete. It can be hit and miss. It's worth trying, uh, but it's not a guarantee. What is the R flag not in the manual page for RMD? Uh, probably because, is it really not in the man page? Yes. Um, it might be because RM R, oh, it isn't, it's in my man page. What are you using the, uh, are you, what version of, are you using the VM or not? Yeah. Are you on the VM? We're in the root there. Oh, sorry. So root there doesn't, it's only remove the directory. Fair enough. Occurs. So if you are on a very old system, there will be no dash R flag. But again, any system in the last 15 years or even 20 years is going to have that option. Questions on deleting directories, deleting files. So sometimes RMDIR is still useful if you know you have an empty directory. So like if I just quickly make a directory and then I know it's empty and I just want to delete it. I mean, arguably I can type RMDIR as quickly as I can type RM-R. There's really no difference in this case. This is safer. If you're in a case where you want to make sure you're only deleting empty directories, you can take advantage of the property. This will fail on non-empty directories. So sometimes it's handy. I have a big home folder. Maybe I want to get rid of any empty directories anywhere in my home folder. So we'll go over this when we do scripting. But I could write a command that just goes into every folder and calls rmdir star. Now, you wouldn't ever do that with rm because it would delete everything. But because I know this is going to fail on full directories, that will then effectively only delete empty directories, which if that's what I want to do, I might have leverage that behavior. Other questions? OK. Um, that's all I'm going to say for file commands for now. So we'll come back and continue to add to these. I want to get to Matt since I'm already running long, and he's going to go over another set of commands. Um, last chance, file, file-related questions. Cool.